Hello, seniors. I'm glad you are still here listening to an exciting lesson related to life science. I'm Mom De La Sorina, and I'll be presenting to you today's amazing lesson. Are you excited? So do I. So let's make the most out of our class time. Learn while having fun. My dear students, our lesson today, lesson 9, Interaction and Interdependence. At the end of this module, you should be able to identify biotic factors and abiotic factors and categorize biotic potential and environmental resistance that affect population growth. Every living organism on Earth depends on and interacts with other living and non-living things to stay alive. Organisms depend on other organisms for food, for example, and also depend on their environment for protection and a place to stay. The particular branch of science that studies how organisms interact with other organisms and their environment is called ecology. Someone who studies these relationships and interactions is called an ecologist. The ecological interactions that take place within a specific area are generally classified into four levels, populations, communities, ecosystems, and the biosphere. Individuals live together in populations. Different populations together make up a community. Communities together with the non-living things in their surroundings make up an ecosystem. All the ecosystems on Earth make up the biosphere. A population is a group of organisms of the same species that live in the same area at a specific point in time and they can interbreed with each other. When a scientist studies a population, they might study how the population grows and the factors that affect how the population increases or decreases. They will also look at how the population interacts with the environment. In ecology, a community refers to all the populations of organisms that interact in a certain area. Community ecology is the study of how they interact. For example, what feeding relationships occur in the area? What types of grasses do specific herbivores eat and what eats the herbivores? The different populations interact with each other to form a community. When we look at how the communities interact with the non-living things in their environment, then we are looking at ecology at the ecosystem level. All the ecosystems on Earth combined make up the biosphere. At the biosphere level, we can study how the living and non-living things interact on a much larger scale. This includes climate changes, how the Earth has changed over history, and even how the movement of planet Earth affects different ecosystems, wind patterns, as well as rock and soil formation. Let's now take a closer look at ecosystems. The living organisms on Earth live and interact in different ecosystems around the planet. Together, all these ecosystems make up the Earth's biosphere. An ecosystem consists of the abiotic or the non-living environment and the biotic or living organisms. But how do the biotic things interact with the abiotic environment in a system? Apart from the recycling water, biotic and abiotic factors also interact to recycle carbon dioxide and oxygen in ecosystems. Photosynthesis in plants uses carbon dioxide to produce glucose. The plants and animals then break down the sugars and release carbon dioxide again during respiration. Photosynthesis releases oxygen, while plants and animals take it in for respiration. The size of a real ecosystem is not defined in terms of area, but rather by the interactions that occur inside it. 
Within an ecosystem, the species living in a particular area can interact in different ways with each other. We can classify the interactions between organisms as follows. 1. Competition When two species in an ecosystem need to share a valuable and often limited resource such as food or water, they are in competition with each other. The two different species compete with each other for the same resources, especially food. Hyenas and vultures are both scavengers and compete for the same food. Number 2. Symbiosis Symbiosis describes the way in which two different species living together in the same community interact with each other over a long time period. This can occur in the form of parasitism, mutualism, or commensalism. In parasitism, it is when the one species benefits or gains something from the relationship and the other species is harmed in some way. The host may die in some interactions. Ticks are parasites and feed off the blood of many animals, for example dogs, cows, bacs, and humans. Mutualism Mutualism occurs between any two species where both of the individuals benefit from the interaction. Both species gain something from the other, so we can say it is mutually beneficial. Commensalism In some interactions between individuals from different species, the one species benefits while the other one is unaffected by the relationship. Unlike parasitism, in commensalism, the other species is not harmed or benefited in any way. A whale shark with remora fish is an example. The remora fish get scraps of food that fall out of the shark's mouth, and the whale shark is unaffected. Number 3. Feeding Different species in an ecosystem are related and interact with one species can use the other species as a food source. For example, in predator-prey relationships, the one species or the predator will hunt another species, called prey. Let's now take a closer look at how organisms interact through their feeding relationships. Living organisms need to feed to be able to perform the other life processes. Some organisms can produce their own food, such as plants, while other organisms cannot do this and need to feed on other organisms to obtain their energy. We can therefore identify different feeding types in an ecosystem based on how the organism obtains or gets its food. These are producers and consumers. Producers are organisms that are able to produce their own organic food. They do not need to eat other organisms to do this. Producers are also called autotrophs. Which organisms have we come across that can make their own food? The term autotroph comes from the Greek words autos meaning self and trophe meaning nourishing. So autotroph means self-feeding. Plants are producers because they make their own food during photosynthesis. Consumers Organisms which cannot produce their own food need to eat other organisms to get food. These organisms are called consumers. All animals are consumers as they cannot produce their own food. Consumers are also called heterotrophs. The term heterotroph comes from the Greek words heteros meaning different and trophe meaning nourishing. So heterotroph means different feeding or feeding on different things. There are many types of consumers and we can classify them into specific groups depending on the food that they consume. The four types of consumers in ecology are herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, and decomposers. Herbivores are consumers who only eat vegetables, plants, grass, or some type of vegetation. An example of an herbivore would be a horse or a cow. 
a carnivore is a consumer who eats meat or something that consumes other consumers. An example here would be a lion or a tiger. Omnivores are animals who are a combination of the first two, in that they consume a mixed diet of vegetation and meat. Examples of omnivores would be bears, humans, and birds. The last group, the composers, consume the remains of dead plants or animals. Examples of this would be fungi or bacteria. Each one of these consumers occupies its own unique space in the grand circle life. Moving on, let's have the energy flow. The flow of energy from the sun to different organisms in an ecosystem is very important as it supports all the life processes of living organisms. Let's look more closely at the way in which energy flows from the sun to different organisms in order to support and sustain life on Earth. Energy is vital for organisms to carry out their life processes. All energy in food webs comes from the sun. Plants trap sunlight energy during photosynthesis and convert it to chemical potential energy in food compounds, which are available to animals. Herbivores get energy directly from plants, but carnivores and omnivores eat animals for energy. This energy transfer is shown by food chains. Can you see how food chain describes how the energy is passed along from the producer to the consumers. But there are different three different consumers to be exact in this food chain. So how can we distinguish between the different consumers? Well, animals that eat plants are primary consumers. Primary means first. Animals that eat primary consumers are called secondary consumers. Animals that eat the secondary consumers, mostly predators, are the tertiary consumers. Each of these levels in the food chain is called a trophic level. The organism uses up to 90% of its food energy itself for its life processes, and only about 10% of the energy goes into new body cells and is available to the next animal when it gets eaten. This loss of energy at each trophic level can be shown by an energy pyramid. The main goal of any species is to reproduce and ensure the survival of the species. Factors beyond the control of the species often influence these and limit the growth of the population. These disruptions cause an imbalance in the ecosystem and can affect the organisms that live there as well as the ecosystem as a whole. The factors that disrupt a balanced ecosystem are natural factors and human factors. Natural disasters like floods or hurricanes can cause severe disruptions to ecosystems, but the ecosystems recover eventually. If the change occurs over long periods like climate change and global warming, the damage may not be reversible. For example, there are many different theories about why the dinosaurs become extinct. One of the main theories is a sudden change in climate. This sudden change, whether it was due to a meteor striking Earth or not, disrupted the balance in the ecosystems. It was to such an extent that all the dinosaurs died out. Modern man has, however, had a huge effect on nature. We clear land to build cities, roads, and farms. We pollute the environment and produce waste and litter. Humans also poach endangered animals and overharvest marine animals, causing lasting damage to ecosystems. Another way in which humans have a huge impact on the environment and cause disruption to ecosystems is through pollution. That was an amazing lesson, isn't it? I hope you learned a lot in today's topic. Thank you for listening and don't forget to take care of yourself by staying at home. See you again next time. Bye-bye!